they are all. I guess by now you have seen all the videos on different types of probability sampling. Now in this video I am going to start with non-probability sampling. Now before I start, just to give you a refresher, these are the different types of non-probability sampling. So we have quota sampling, purposive sampling, convenience sampling, volunteer sampling and snowball sampling. Let's start with convenience sampling. All of the concepts of non-probability sampling are very, very easy. Alright? Let me give you a small trick here before I start. The actual details or the meaning of the sampling method is hidden in the name. So as soon as I read the name, I guess many of you will be able to understand what is the true meaning of that sampling method. For example, convenience sampling. So as the name suggests, it is something related to convenience, right? So let's take a look at the definition here. Here it goes. In convenience sampling, elements for the sample are selected for the convenience of the researcher. The researcher typically chooses elements that are readily available, nearby, or willing to participate. So yes, convenience sampling is that type of sampling method where the researcher looks at their own convenience first. And based on that convenience, they select people or things that are easy for them to select. Let me give you an example here. For example, I ask you to do a survey on daily study hours of students. It can be any student. It can be a high school student. It can be a university student, any kind of student. Now, just to mention, it is quite a long survey, all right? It takes half an hour to fill in the survey. So it has a lot of questions. So now you are sitting at your home. So you are thinking of your own convenience, right? So what is the easiest way you can select a respondent for this survey? Now, let's say you have a younger brother. So what you do now is this. You instruct or sort of force your younger brother to fill in the half an hour long survey. And he is really angry at you for that because it's half an hour, right? Now, what did you do here? You thought of your own convenience first. That yes, this is the most convenient method for you to select a case for your sample. Why? Because no one else is going to fill in a survey which is half an hour long. So it's going to be difficult for you to even convince your friends to fill in the survey. But when it comes to your younger siblings, you may kind of use some sort of force on that person to fill in the survey. So that is the most convenience method for you, all right? So this is why if you use this method, it can be classified as convenience sampling. So yes, in convenience sampling, the researcher looks at their own convenience first. So what are the basic benefits of convenience sampling? I have listed down six benefits and I guess these are really, really easy. If I just read them out. So in convenience sampling, you can collect data quickly. Yes, obviously, because you are looking at your convenience first. Then it is inexpensive, easy to do research. Then we have low cost, readily available sample, and fewer rules to follow. So as I said just earlier, all of these points are really, really easy to understand. So I'm not going to explain each of these points any further. Without further delay, let's move on to the next sampling method, which is purposive or judgment sampling. So again, the meaning is hidden in the name here. Let's start with the word judgment first. So it is called judgment sampling. So in this sampling, we use some sort of judgment. What is that judgment? Let's take a look at the definition. Judgment sampling occurs when elements or cases selected for the sample are chosen by the judgment of the researcher. So here, the researcher uses their own judgment, own thinking in selecting each of the cases for the sample. Again, here we use our own judgment to select cases. What sort of judgment? Here is the answer. Use your judgment to select cases who will be best able to answer your research questions and to meet your objectives. So that is the reason we call it judgment sampling. So yes, in this sampling method, the researcher, they use their own judgment that yes, this person or this case will be able to answer my research question the best. So if I go to this person, my research purpose will be fulfilled because that person will be able to give a very thorough interview on this topic. And that is why, based on my judgment, I'm going to select that person as one of my cases. Let me give you a practical example here, and then it will be crystal clear to you. Suppose this is a research question. 
when will the COVID-19 vaccine come out? So in order to get a thorough answer for this research question, who do you think might be the best person to give a well-educated response? What does your judgment say here? Now, my judgment says I will go to famous health professionals or researchers. I will interview scientists from Oxford, Cambridge, or even famous professionals in Bangladesh. They will be able to provide the best possible answer to my question. So based on my judgment, I will select people from these groups as my cases in my sample. And that is why it will be called a judgment sampling. Now, why is this same sampling method also called purposive sampling? Because I'm going to select someone who is going to fulfill my purpose of the research. All right. So that is why it's also called purposive sampling. All right. Now let's move on to the next sampling method, which is volunteer sampling or self-select sampling. Again, the meaning is hidden in the name, right? So volunteer or self-select. So what happens here? Here, participants voluntarily take part in the research. So the cases in the sample are going to participate voluntarily or select themselves on their own. So what happens here, we publicize our need for cases either by advertising through appropriate media or by asking them to take part in the survey or the interview. And then we collect data from those who want to respond or want to take part in the survey. So again, we can post an advertisement about our research topic and provide the link to a survey or an interview publicly. And whoever is willing to participate in the survey or the interview, they click on the link and then fill in the survey. Now, I guess many of you by now have understood when you post a link to the survey on your Facebook account, that is sort of a volunteer sampling. Why? Because you are posting the link publicly and inviting your friends to participate in the survey. And those who want to participate voluntarily, they click on the link and fill in the survey. Now, what are some of the other ways we can do volunteer sampling? Here it goes. So here, publicity can take many forms. We can do advertisements in magazines where we invite participants to participate in the survey. We can do posts on appropriate online news groups and discussion groups. And also we can post hyperlinks from other websites as well as letters, emails, or tweets of invitation to colleagues and friends. In all of these methods, we are basically inviting people to voluntarily participate in the survey or the interview. And that is why it's called volunteer or self-select sampling. All right, so in this video, we have discussed three non-probability sampling methods. Thank you for listening to this video. In the next video, I'm going to discuss the topic of snowball sampling.